I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. This is James Altucher. I am here with Sally Hogshead, author of the book uh, Fascinate. Uh, Sally, what's the what's the subtitle of Fascinate? I don't have it right in front of me here. The subtitle of Fascinate is Your Seven Triggers to Persuasion and Captivation. But James, I have to tell you, I have a new book out that I think is going to be even more relevant named How the World Sees You. Uh, right. So it's how the world sees you discover your highest value through the science of fascination. You're fascinated mm-hmm. with fascination. I am fascinated with fascination because fascination is the key for us as entrepreneurs and communicators to get our ideas heard so that instead of coming up with ideas for the sake of coming up with ideas, instead of losing pitches, instead of being nor- ignored and forgotten by our prospects, we can come in, we can make a difference, we can sell our ideas, we can grow our businesses, and we can become intensely valuable to the people who matter most. And so, so Sally, this all started when you, you gave over 100,000 people personality tests and to, to help them figure out basically where they were on kind of your, your fascination score and how they can get to be, you know, how they can use your seven triggers to become essentially more charismatic. I'm going I'm to use the word charisma where you often use fascination. Yeah, you're right. And the, 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 the difference is that a traditional personality assessment like a Myers-Briggs or a Strengths Finder or DISC, all those assessments are built on psychology. So they show you how you see the world. But instead of looking at how you see the world, it's more important today to understand how the world sees you. And in order to understand how the world sees you, you have to be able to see yourself through the lens of marketing. So I took my decade of experience as a, as a brand leader and an, an advertising agency owner, working with brands like Nike, Coca-Cola, Target, Mini Cooper. I took that experience of helping brands find exactly the right words to describe themselves and I, I, I turned that into a personality assessment. In the first year of helping people understand how the world sees them at their best, we had 30,000 people do the assessment. And that's when I realized 
after 30,000 people took it, 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 the numbers started to take off like crazy. So we began to do more and more research around this. And now at this point, I've studied 500,000 people, including programs inside of AT&T and GE and Cisco, working with over 100,000 entrepreneurs at a very high-end level to help them understand how their prospects, how their customers and clients see them at their very best. Okay, let, let me ask you a couple of questions about that, because on the one hand, there's there's a lot written about the power of authenticity. Like I I myself, um, I don't want to say I pride myself, but I don't normally think of what do other people think of me? I want to be as authentic and as me as possible, because then I feel I'll stand out in a world where everybody else is worried what other people will think of them. Um, how, how do you respond to something like that? Authenticity is all about being relaxed and confident when you talk with somebody so that you can be yourself and so that you can build a true connection instead of, instead of being artificial. The problem happens, especially as entrepreneurs, we go into a pitch or we go into a, a, an introduction at a networking event or even just a conversation with somebody that we haven't met before, and we're trying to read the signals from them in order to decide how to communicate. And what happens when we go into a, a first introduction when we can't be ourselves, when we feel uncomfortable, when we feel awkward, we make our listener feel awkward. And that's where inauthenticity comes in and uh, kills our chances of building a connection and getting a great result. Neurologically, when you feel relaxed and confident when you communicate, your listener is more likely to feel confident in you. And that's when you have a chance to really influence their decision and to impress them. When you understand how your listener is most likely to perceive your communication at your best, then you can just play to that every time, and it becomes really easy to focus on who you already are. Instead of trying to make yourself over, instead of trying to masquerade as, as the funny guy or the powerful guy or the, uh, the detail-oriented guy, instead, you can just figure out, what is it my listener is most likely to value in me? And they can just hone in on that, and I can keep doing it over and over again. So okay. That Oh, so sorry, you're building sorry. your business around who you are. So, so this is a very important distinction because I think there's a lot of uh, mythology about, oh, well, if I stand with my chest out, my chest out, people will perceive me as more powerful. Or if I shake them with a firm handshake or if I uh, look them straight in the eye, you know, there's all these kind of like fake body cues that you can use. Right, to, right. To supposedly yeah, the make whole body language like thing, yeah. Yeah, but you're, what you're saying is find out what is authentic about you, find out what they're going to appreciate, and then let, and then, uh, let that authenticity shine even brighter to them. Yeah, exactly, so that you can be focusing in on those traits. Let, let, James, let's take a look at it just from the perspective of from a brand. The, most, the world's powerful, valuable, loved brands understand who they are in the market. They don't try to be like everybody else. When you look at the brands that really stand out that are able to charge premium prices, like Apple or Starbucks or Nike or, or uh, other clients of mine, th they aren't trying to be all things to all people. Instead, they understand how they're different, and they're not focusing on their strengths. They're focusing on their differences. In the same way, if, when we come into a competitive or crowded, commoditized, distracted marketplace, it's crucial for us to understand how we're naturally different so that we can keep doing that over and over again. And we can infuse that into not only our marketing and our LinkedIn profile and our business card, but also into how we hire and how we grow our businesses and how we build our presentations and our discussions. Well, okay. So would you say, um, let's, let's say I'm in a marketplace, whether it's a human marketplace where, like, for instance, the job market or the dating market or a, a product marketplace, like when you're a company trying to sell something. Are you saying the very first thing one should focus on is to identify how are we different? How are people likely to perceive you as being different and better than others? Let, let's, you, you mentioned the online dating marketplace. Let's use that one because it's a great example. Every year, there are 12 million people who are on, 12 million guys who are on Match.com trying to get the attention of a woman. And if the profile if a, if a guy's profile looks like every other profile, it doesn't matter if that guy is actually the most charming in the bunch or perfect match for, for somebody in the, in the audience. If the profile doesn't stand out, he's just going to get lost in the flotsam and jetsam of the 12 million other guys who are competing for her attention. In the same way as an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter if you have the best ideas if you don't get credit for that. 
it doesn't matter if you would actually be the perfect fit for a certain client if that client doesn't realize that and acknowledge it and give you the chance to actually execute those ideas. And so in this book, How the World Sees You, I've created a way to measure how do people see you at your best? What are the traits that are most likely to make you valuable, admired, loved by your audience so that you can focus in on those? And instead of watering down your communication, you can hone in on what you're already doing right. Okay. So I'd like to take, so, so I think um, if I'm representative of the audience listening to this podcast, I think to myself, okay, I'm in several different situations. Sometimes I'm giving a public talk and I want to, I want to be perceived as different and interesting and unique and inspiring. Or sometimes I'm in a meeting where, um, you know, trying to have people take my advice or perceive me as intelligent or wise enough to give advice. What should I personally focus on? Like, how can, how can you help me, uh, be a better version of me in these situations? You don't need to change who you are to fit each situation. You don't want to change who you are. You want to become more of who you are. When we've studied high-performing entrepreneurs, what we found is there are a wide range of personality traits, wide range of personality styles. Some of them could be called charismatic. Other ones would be called quietly intense and decidedly uncharismatic. There's one thing they have all in common, and that is that they understand their personality needs to have a specialty. There has to be one way that they're over-delivering in terms of their, their natural personality qualities that they're bringing to the conversation and bringing to the client. So, for example, in our studies, when um, certain entrepreneurs naturally apply power, they are naturally opinionated, they're leaders, they are confident. They don't have to try to use that cheesy body language we were talking about a moment ago with their chest puffed out. Instead, they naturally come in from a point of expertise and they're an authority. And so they can be really authentic when they're in that position of power. On the other hand, there are other entrepreneurs that, that don't follow that model, and instead they are introspective, they're observant, they're able to create systems and, and uh, line up a bunch of rational pieces like a chess player. Those are two totally different personalities. When you understand how your client is likely to see you at your best, then you don't have to try to pretend that you're one or the other, and instead you can focus in on those traits that you already have so that instead of driving yourself crazy and exhausting yourself by wearing all the hats and being all things to all people, you can build your entire business around your personality specialty. That's what I call your advantage. It's a natural competitive advantage that you have within you that you already have. You've always had it. It's like an asset that you don't have to invest money in. You don't have to spend more money on marketing or grow your overhead or hire more employees. And instead, just double down on doing more of what your client already values. And in our studies, we found that people will pay four times more, four times more for a person that they perceive as intensely valuable in one particular way with their personality specialty. Well, okay. And I've, I've, kind of when you're saying that I kind of have experienced that, but can you give me a specific case study? Sure. Um, in, it, it, before I studied people, before I studied individuals, I studied brands and we gave women two different pairs of sunglasses that were exactly the same, exactly the same sunglasses. The only difference was that one pair had a Chanel logo and the other one did not have a Chanel logo. And we asked women how much they'd be willing to pay for them. Women were willing to pay four times more for the pair with, uh, with the Chanel logo. In other words, that logo quadrupled the perceived value of it. In the same way in the marketplace, if you go into a presentation or pitch and you have a specialty that's, that, that people associate as being the perfect solution to their problem, people will pay uh, um, well over double for, for that quality. There was a great study that was done with the Carnegie Institute of Technology, and they found that 85% of your financial success is due to your personality, your ability to communicate, negotiate, and lead. And only 15% of your financial success is connected to your technical knowledge. So okay. instead of focusing on technical knowledge, instead of trying to grow how much you know, grow how your personality is perceived by other people so that you can keep focusing on that. And that's the, that's the key today in a commoditized environment to becoming more valuable and earning more and growing your business. Okay, so I want to I want to hone in then on what people can do to improve their ability to communicate, their ability to lead and so on. And so you list uh seven triggers that help people fascinate mm -hmm. others. Uh mm -hmm. the first one is power. 
So I walk into a room. How can I um, kind of bring out my ability to assert power in the room? Well, first of all, there, there are certain there are certain of these seven different advantages that you're either using or you're not using, and you shouldn't try to pretend that you have it if you don't. Instead, you should focus in on on the one or two that naturally come to you. I'll just I'll do a quick review so that you you have it at your fingertips. There are seven different advantages, and you can think of each of them like a different personality style or mode of communication: power, passion, mystique, prestige, alert, innovation, and trust. Power personalities come in and they have what, we, what are uh, opinions of authority. You, you, James, you use the power advantage. You are naturally a confident, authoritative person. You also use the innovation advantage. You're creative, you're entrepreneurial, you're pioneering and irreverent. You're very comfortable with an untraditional, unorthodox point of view. On the other hand, there are other personalities that, that don't use power and innovation like you do. Let's take an example of, of uh, um, a traditional financial advisor who's working with high net worth clients in an older age bracket who are getting ready for retirement. Um, th it, according to our studies, those personalities are gonna score very high on trust. They're gonna wanna do the same thing over and over again. They're gonna be very schedule oriented, regimented, predictable, dependable, reliable. Um, they're they're going to do business the same way every single year, year in and year out. There are certain advantages to using trust because then people feel like they can grow loyalty with you. On the other hand, trust personalities are a great risk of becoming irrelevant in the marketplace. So you, if you imagine, James, if you're competing against somebody who scores very high on the trust advantage, according to the fascination advantage assessment, the way you would want to compete against them is by coming in and showing your client an untraditional point of view to say, look, the market's changed. You've changed. Your financial situation has changed. So let's change your, um, your investment strategy so that you can be looking at new ways of seeing how you can profit from this. And, and in doing so, you'd be positioning yourself in a very different way than a, than a traditional, staid, uh, uh, predictable financial advisor. And so let's say I was going into a situation where I was trying to be a financial advisor. Would I, um, even though I kind of have, let's say, a, a different look about me than someone who's a little older and in a suit and tie and very reliable, how can I build the trust for myself between myself and the, and the potential client. Remember, you don't want to change who you are. You want to become more of who you are. So you don't have that. If you don't score high in the trust advantage, then don't try to play that card because that's not something that's going to be authentic for you. And if you tried to pretend that you were that, you would be perceived as inauthentic, which we know from earlier in our conversation is a huge turnoff and it leads to people shutting you out and going on to the next option. Instead, what you would want to do is to think, what is, what is the tool that I have that other people in my market don't have? And how can I position myself as being as different as possible from other financial advisors? So you might think to yourself before you go in to talk to a, a prospective client, you might think, okay, how can I apply creativity in a way that other people would not. So other financial advisors are going to come in and they're going to show the brochure and they're going to have a canned speech and they're going to be selling the same services, the same products as everybody else. You might come in and say, um, you might ask some questions that would give you information that would help you find a less traditional way of charting their financial future. You might be more progressive. You might say, look, there are new options that you haven't considered. You might think about it in a bolder way. You might say, look, the, you haven't changed your portfolio for a decade now. We really need to be thinking differently because valuation has changed. So let's start looking at some things that you haven't considered before. And by giving them new ideas, you'd be adding value to that, that relationship so that you're not a transaction and you're not a commodity. The problem is that, that most people, especially entrepreneurs, most of us are selling products and services that our, our clients and prospects can get somewhere else and maybe get it cheaper, um, uh, more conveniently, um, maybe even faster. So we need to find a way to compete based on what we already have within our personalities. And the good news is we already have this amazing competitive advantage built into our personalities so that when we apply this in our communication with our prospects and we build our team around it, then we can really start to get a, a business that scales much more quickly. So, so, um, so I'm still trying to understand, like, let's say uh, I'm taking these seven different triggers. You're basically saying each of us have different, uh, variation, different um, levels of these triggers, and we should use them to our advantage to kind of beat out the competition who might not be as aware of their triggers as they could be. 
that's classic positioning, right? You know, within a marketplace, if you position yourself as being the lowest priced option or the same as the bigger competitor, you're going to lose. I mean, who, who wants to compete on the basis of price? When you compete on the basis of price, you're, you're not going to have loyalty. You're not going to get referrals. You're not going to be distinct in any way. And ultimately, you're just going to become um, a, a parody product that gets priced out and irrelevant. Instead, what you want to do is to say, what is everybody else doing and how can I find some key competitive difference that's natural to me so that I can continue applying it? Here's the problem. We grew up with this idea that we have to focus on our strengths. When you focus on your strengths, then you can be outdone by somebody else who's smarter, who's got a bigger marketing budget than you, uh, who's more famous than you, who's, more, um, who, who's better connected than you. You don't want to compete on strengths. Instead, you want to compete on differences. The greatest value that you can add to your clients is to become more of who you already are. And when you focus on who you already are and you show them how to use this in, in, uh, in, in, in your sales and in, in every interaction that you have, it becomes really easy for you to just uh, carve out a position in the market that's, that's unique. What about um, – tell, tell me about the mystique trigger because I, I like the word mystique. Yeah, it's a great word, isn't it? People who use Mystique are great listeners. They're observant. They stand back. They watch. They see what all the pieces are. They don't jump right into the limelight. You, 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 when you think of people who use Mystique, I want you to think of somebody like a Mark Zuckerberg who doesn't play all his cards immediately and who, who doesn't, um, who doesn't uh, seek out the spotlight and instead quietly thinks through how to solve problems. Um, the, an example of a, of a mystique personality is the mastermind. The, uh, the archetype, the mastermind, is named for a person who is methodical, intense, systematic. They tend to be great at IT. They're really good at behind-the-scenes decision-making. They're a solo intellect. They don't necessarily want to be part of group brainstorming sessions. But what they're really great at is taking a huge volume of data and analyzing that data and, uh, and systematically finding the right answer. That's a totally different competitive advantage than somebody who uses passion. The passion advantage, which is my number one advantage, people who have a primary passion advantage love to be able to connect. We like relationship. We use a lot of body language. I don't know if you can tell them while I'm talking to you. I'm sitting here gesticulating with You're my hands. You're all over the place. So, your hands are as everywhere. Though we're, as though you and I are sitting across an, an Italian dinner with a glass of wine right now. And so my competitive advantage would be coming into a, a, a pitch or a, a meeting and instantly creating an emotional response in the person that I'm trying to talk to and creating a, creating a bond, creating engagement. I'm not going to solve a problem like a mystique personality. I'm not going to sit there in, the, in, a, in a back room and try to figure out the answer on a spreadsheet by myself. Instead, I want to be right in the thick of the action. But different people have different advantages. And if you don't know how the world sees you at your best, then you could be playing to a disadvantage. In other words, you could be creating a negative impression in your listener that's actually turning them off and disincentivizing them from communicating with you in the future. So, so if like I sort of think of myself as a mystique person, but rather I'm more a, uh, you know, I don't know, passion or power person or whatever, uh, I could be ruining my chances with a, with a client. Like if I sit well, back, but they're expecting me to have passion, I'm screwed. Um, you would be damaging your chances of having the best possible outcome because you'd be playing to a disadvantage. Let, let me ask you a different question. What are, what's an example of a task or an assignment or a project or a conversation that exhausts you and drains you, that you dread it? You know, you see it on your calendar and you're like, oh, God, I have to do that. What would that be for you? Well, I'm very, I'm very non-confrontational. Uh, so if I find I have to go to a board meeting, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of many companies. So if I have to go to a board meeting where, I, where I've already recognized that all the other directors are wimps and I have to confront the CEO with the financial damage he's doing to his company, that's usually not something I look forward to. So you don't want to be the guy who comes in and slams your fists on the table and plays bad cop and tells everybody why they're wrong. Right, I like to be a friend, um, and so. But if I'm, uh, but I also, I also don't like to lose money. So if I have to be the uh, authority of last resort, then that's what I'll be. But but I really hate it. 
I like that authority of last resort. So as you're thinking about your career, you don't want to put yourself into a position in which your success or failure is going to be determined by your ability to be an authority of last resort. In other words, if you kept putting yourself in that situation, not only would you be exhausted, but it would become a struggle. You wouldn't be perceived at your best. In fact, you could actually be damaging people's perception of you because you would dread it. I, I would I mean? dread it. So, so what I would do, because I recognize this in myself, is that I would try to gain consensus on both sides before the confrontation. So I would mm -hmm. try to basically get the board, other board members to state their minds. And I would try to get the CEO to listen despite his stubbornness. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually thinking of a specific example from several years ago. So nothing on my current slate, I should mention, but, uh, uh, that's what I would do. That's a great example. So for you quick, it feels like quicksand. Quicksand are those those tasks or conversations or or scenarios that drain you of your energy. You can't build your career around those things that feel like quicksand because uh, it, it's just it, it's going to be very expensive in terms of your emotional energy and your intellect, and it, it it doesn't allow you to rise to your highest and best use. On the other hand, there are some people for whom that feels like exactly what they want to do. You know, they want to come in and play Gordon Gecko, and they want to be the fist slammer on the table, and they, they, they want to be the authority of last resort. And for them, that would feel invigorating. It would help them feel productive and focused. One isn't better than the other, but it's important for you to know what are the situations in which you have a competitive advantage so that you can focus in on those and not focus on the others. For me, for example, details exhaust me. The, the worst thing I could think of is somebody to hand me a spreadsheet and say, okay, we want you to sit down and uh, go, go through and double check this list. And when you're done, we'll give you another list. So it's important for me to know that when I'm building my team, I've got to hire people who are really good at details. And that's the alert advantage. And so when I hire people, I don't just look at their resume because I can teach them skills or experience, but you can't give somebody a personality advantage that they don't have. I want to find people who are naturally great, who find a wellspring, who, who feel energized by details so that I don't have to do that. So instead, I can specialize like those high performers I was talking about earlier and I can over deliver in the area of creativity and relationship because that's where I'm going to be able to give the most value to my clients. That's my highest and best use. But how, how could like, I, I'm not so sure. I believe that a test can determine if someone is detail oriented. Like if someone says, yes, I'm detail oriented, that doesn't mean they're detail oriented. It just says that they're saying they're detail oriented. That would be true with a traditional personality assessment, because remember, a traditional personality assessment is built on psychology, and it's measuring how you see the world. But this assessment, the fascination advantage, is measuring the opposite. It's measuring how the world sees you. It's built on branding, and what it's measuring is not how you perceive other people, but what are the cues and signals that you're putting out into the world, and, and then how do people respond to those cues and signals? When we first started the research a decade ago, it was all about brands and companies and how, how uh, businesses create messages and how people respond to those messages. And now when we moved it over to people, we found that the, the people respond to certain signals and cues in the same way. In other words, if you uh, detail-oriented people come into situations and they can see with crystal clarity what all the ramifications are, instead of looking at things in terms of what they could be, they look at what they actually are. So we ask them questions like, are you, uh, do, do you seek opportunity or do you, uh, do, you, do you try to avoid consequences? And we go through and we, we begin to um, analyze their data according to our algorithm to find those points of people that are naturally able to, um, to be detail-oriented. And when we go into companies like, um, we went into Unilever, and they were 34% more confident after understanding how they could be most likely to contribute to their clients. With entrepreneurs, when, when you understand what you can hone in on, what, what, is your, what is your natural difference that allows you to stop focusing on just products and services and instead start, start to build a relationship, um, and, uh, and, and then we give them the actual words to use when they're making an introduction. So, so okay, so what, let's say I'm going into a meeting and I want to win uh, a client or a customer or whatever. Let's say it's an enterprise customer. Or, or I don't know, let's say I'm going on a date or whatever. What should I do to not necessarily change myself, but improve myself? What, what should I do today? First of all, 
every time you're communicating, you're doing one of two things. You're either adding value or you're taking up space. When you add value, people want more of your opinion. They follow you. They believe in you. They trust you. They buy from you. They hire I, you. I love that. I, I want to repeat that. So you're either doing one of two things. You're adding value or you're taking up space. So how do I know when, uh, when I'm taking up space? When you're taking up space, you are not contributing to the other person. They're, they're not getting anything for their exchange of, of their attention span. They're giving you their attention, but they're not getting anything in return. It's sort of like spam. So when you're just taking up space, you're human spam. And we know what happens to spam. It, get, it gets deleted. It gets ignored. It gets filtered out. We've all been in media. How does one know? Do some, people know when they're spam, like kind of naturally? No, they don't naturally know when they're spam. But here's some indications. When people don't take action on what you say, you're just taking up space. When, pe when your ideas don't, uh, don't enroll people to, uh, to, help, to turn into reality, your ideas are just taking up space. We've all been in those meetings where you put great ideas on the wall and those ideas never actually become anything. Well, it doesn't matter if you have great ideas if those ideas don't actually turn into something that makes a difference, that gets people okay, to so, take action. Okay, so what happens is, I, I, uh, let's say towards the beginning of the meeting, I throw out some ideas and people seem to either be ignoring them or putting them to the side or nodding their heads, but nothing really gets starts to happen. So I start to realize I'm taking up space. What should I do? You should adjust your strategy in the same way that a brand, if a, if a brand runs television commercials that don't get anybody to come into the store and buy or don't get anybody talking on social media or don't incite some kind of emotional response, that advertisement is just taking up space. So if you're communicating and you're not getting your desired result, you either need to change the what you're communicating or you need to change how you're communicating it. So here's an example. Let's take the, um, we'll take the, the, the example that you had just a moment ago. Imagine that you are coming into a meeting and you're, you're thinking so creatively about the problem that you are giving them ideas that they're never actually going to be able to practically apply. So you're coming in and you know, you've got, you've got these great ideas that are visionary and long-range thinking, but really what the client needs to do, they just have to get through the next week with cash flow. So they're not really interested in seeing how they could reinvent their brand. Instead, Okay, with, this, you know, this is a great example, actually. Quota. Sorry? This is a great example, actually. I, I have to deal with this often. Yeah, so if you're, if, if you're coming into a meeting and you have what are great ideas, but those ideas don't help, solve, help them solve a problem, then, then they're not good ideas. It's not enough for an idea to be good in a vacuum. It's not enough for you to think your ideas are good. The ideas actually have to plug into a problem to create a solution. So if you come up with great ideas, but they don't actually um, create an outcome or, or a positive result for the listener, then you should either stop giving the ideas or you should change the way that you're introducing those ideas. So in the example that we've, that we've just had with your ideas are too creative for your client, you have a couple of options. One idea is you could say to yourself, uh, once you realize that really what they need is just a week of cash flow to be able to make it through to quota, you might, you might shift the type of ideas that you're giving and you might say, okay, let's take a look at what has worked in the past. The, way, the times when you've had the greatest increase in cash flow over the course of one week is, and then you go back and you research the facts. Or you might look and say, I'm going to give you some ideas in a folder, and um, after we get through this one week, I'd like to schedule another meeting to come back and revisit these ideas. Or you might, you might partner up with somebody that they're already working with to say, you know, in order to get through this one week, it's really not about the week. It's really much about uh, uh, creating a much longer-term change. I had this situation, this exact situation happened when I worked with Jägermeister. When Jägermeister initially brought me in, you know, Jägermeister, the, the liqueur that tastes like kerosene. Let me guess. You walked into the meeting and everyone was totally trashed. <laughs> yeah, and you, yeah. could, you couldn't They're solve like, their cheers. problems. They were like, what? Right, right. Yeah. No, I, well, I came in when I initially had my first briefing with them, I thought that what Jägermeister wanted were these crazy, outrageous ideas that were going to be, you, you know, that, that 21 year olds were, were, will never have seen before. So I brought in social media ideas and I brought in ways, you know, that we, we can reinvent the brand. And what I very quickly learned was that their brand wasn't broken at all. And what they really needed to do was just keep people drinking the drink. It really wasn't about changing the brand. It was just about making sure people didn't change out to other drinks like um, you know, Jameson. And so, how did you um, do that? What did you do next? Sorry? What did you do next? 
uh, I had to, I had to very quickly readjust and instead of looking at things through a creative lens and think, how do I create change? I needed to look, I needed to look through the lens of how do I help them keep what they already have, but applying creativity in order to be able to do that. So it became looking at in what way is the brand already doing things right that will help them sustain their customer base so that revenue will stay up in the immediate future. But Sally, let me ask you a question. So you identified yourself earlier as someone who uses passion to fascinate the people in the room. Why didn't you start thinking to yourself, okay, I have to show passion for Jägermeister. That's why I'm here. I have to, I have to reinvigorate passion in Jägermeister for these executives. I, I did do that. But what I found that I needed to do it, I needed to invigorate the passion within the customer, within the consumer instead of within the people in the boardroom. Remember, there are a lot of different ways that you can be applying your advantages. You're not just talking to your client. You're also talking to your client's customer, to your prospect's prospect, and so on. So when it's not just about the conversation itself. There are a lot of different ways to have power, a lot of different ways to build trust or to use details. Here's the key. The key is that if you don't know your own value, don't expect anyone else to. If you don't know what makes you valuable to the client, it's not your client's job to figure that out. It's not your prospect's job to figure out what makes you valuable. It's not your team member's job. It's your job. And so you need to identify what makes you most valuable in any type of situation so that you can be reinforcing that over and over again so that you can raise your prices and, and grow your business and, and stop struggling so much. So, so, so obviously someone could figure out, um, like if someone reads your book, How the World Sees You, um, they'll start to figure out, well, okay, these are what I'm strong in. This is what I could uh, use to uh, fascinate the people around me. But what if somebody hasn't read your book? What What are like three or four things they can specifically do to kind of, you know, increase their chances the next time they have a high stakes meeting or talk or date or whatever? When you look back over the course of your life, there are certain times when you've had a remarkable success, when you've over-delivered. And you might think all the way back to how you got into college or, or uh, the first project that you worked on or even something recently in the last week, those times when you were able to raise profits or, or get some kind of a better result. When you look at those situations in the past where you've been remarkably successful and you think about those like telephone poles, what, what's the thread that connects all those? In other words, what, are, what, what do your past achievements all have in common? And when you begin to see that commonality, you can start to predict how you can apply that in the future. When you look back, you might see that it always came down to the numbers, that you were always able to look at the data and extract insight from the information. And if that's the case, then when you go into this meeting and you want to see how you can become more valuable to the client, think about how can you extract the insight from their information. So do research ahead of time. Put together a killer PowerPoint presentation that's going to show them their data in a new way. On the other hand, if you look back over the course of your life and those telephone poles are connected by a different thread, the thread of um, motivating network. And what you've always done best in the past is to, is to tap into your, the circle of people around you and you can rally them and motivate them and build a team, get people organized into projects or, or contests or promotions and, and whip up energy among a large audience, then that's what you should be doing in the meeting. You should be demonstrating to this prospect how you'll be able to do that for them. That would be a totally different way of approaching it than numeric analysis, you know, doing motivating team building. But when you go into the meeting, it's important for you, before you go into the meeting, it's, 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 it's crucial for you to know what is your competitive edge so that you're not just selling yourself on the basis of product or services. See, that's where we kill ourselves as entrepreneurs. We don't realize this natural competitive edge that we have, and instead we keep increasing the budget that we have for marketing or um, we, we try to overwork ourselves or we hire more people or we increase our overhead, and, uh, and, and, and that's a downward spiral. I guess I'm more interested in, in the personal aspects than the brand aspects. I mean, I, I used to run an agency as well, and so I understand the need for brands to capitalize on, on their strengths and so on. But I find lately that most people are kind of looking to figure out what their passions are and then break out into those passions to, to create, let's call them solopreneur or lifestyle entrepreneur businesses. And in order for them to do that, they have to personally figure out 
uh, what their advantages are. And so, for instance, you, you mentioned power as as uh, uh, one of the triggers. When I go into a room, I don't want to. I don't want people to think um, a, an introverted, wimpy guy, even if I am one. Uh, <laughs> I I want to I, I want to exude some kind of power in the room so people look my way. Like let's say right. I'm giving a talk, I want to walk onto that stage and command the stage. So so what would you suggest for me? There's certain there's certain qualities that when you use them to communicate, it it feels great for you. It feels effortless, and this is really what building a lifestyle business is all about. What are those parts of your personality that you could um, that you could do all day long and it doesn't deplete you of energy, it adds energy. For some people, it's going to be powerful. For other people, it's not going to be that. And l- let me give you an example, James. We found that there are certain words that are associated with with each of these different archetypes. And so when we work with entrepreneurs who are building a lifestyle business, what we find is that it's key for them to identify the qualities within themselves so that they can build the business around themselves so that it's something that they actually want to participate in. And that's why it's called lifestyle. You know, that's like, what, what, what is their life? Um, so, so an innovation personality is, uh, they, they change the game with creativity. So it's important for them to understand that everything they do, every email they write, every voicemail they lead, every presentation they have needs to have an element of creativity. Whereas a prestige personality is all about excellence and higher standards and overachieving. So a prestige personality is going to want to be intensely competitive. Now, when we, right now I'm looking, I'm looking at the book, I'm, I'm opening it up and there's a, a matrix here that, that gives entrepreneurs the exact words they need to describe themselves in their marketing copy. And we call that an anthem. Your anthem is the tagline for your personality. And um, here are a couple of examples of anthems. Uh, when, when somebody uses alert plus mystique, then they would describe their highest value as meticulous follow through. The word meticulous is the adjective that describes how they're different and follow through is what they do best. So somebody with meticulous follow through would be great at making sure that every single step is executed and implemented and all the details are handled. On the other hand, uh, when we worked with a, a, an archetype named the ringleader recently, the ringleader is power plus passion, they were all about motivating vision. So they created big ideas that, that, uh, that, that weren't about execution at all and weren't about implementation. When you understand the words that describe how people see you at your best, it becomes really easy for you to take those words and to infuse them into everything that you do, your, your business card, your hold music. Uh, the people you hire, your business plans, your whole business model, and so, uh, and then keep doing that. So, like, let's say, let's say I was about, I don't know, pick two things: power, creativity, and mm-hmm. I'm about, and I'm about to give a, a public talk. Well, how should I? How can I um, reorganize myself to to properly give this talk? Like, what words should I use? If you if you were power and innovation, your archetype would be named the change agent. And the change agent is described as being inventive, untraditional, self-propelled, pioneering, pioneering, and entrepreneurial. And so when you go into this talk, first of all, you could not use the same PowerPoint format as everybody else. You couldn't use the same topic as everybody else. You would come in with some kind of a way that you're surprising the audience by giving them something they didn't have before you walked out on stage. It's, it's, it's your opportunity and even your responsibility to show them something in an entrepreneurial way that provokes them, that, that, that gives them the same information but in a new way so they can have a fresh insight or interpretation. On the other hand, not every speaker should do that. You know, I'm, I'm in the Speaking Hall of Fame, and one thing I've seen from speakers is if you walk out on stage and, you, and you're trying to pretend that you're something you're not, then there's no way you're going to be able to create a real connection with the audience. So imagine if you walked out on stage, James, and you decided that you were going to be, let's say, um, the the most trusted speaker. Then, it, but then you started giving them new ideas. Well, that that would be completely out of sync because you would be trying to build trust with them, but you're giving them a, a new interpretation of things. It's important for you to understand how the audience is going to perceive you, so that you can build your whole presentation around that, just like a pitch. So, is, is there any way to what if I want to be the meticulous follow through guy, but it's just not natural to me. Like, is there any way for people to change who they are? 
Well, you don't want to change who you are. I mean, really, that's part of the reason why we become an entrepreneur is so that we can we can become more of who we already are. But if you wanted to pretend, okay, let's say yeah, let's yeah, yeah. But, but but Sally, let me give you an example. You're an agency, so you kind of have to be what your customer need. Let's say a, let's say American Express calls you and says, make a pitch. And you know American Express needs meticulous follow-through, and that's what your pitch has got to be about, even though that's not what you're about. How can you do it in a way that's natural? That's a great example because a lot of times advertising agencies have to adapt to the style of the, of, of the client. There are three different options. If somebody wants you to communicate in a way that doesn't come naturally for you and doesn't, doesn't feel like an easy thing, there, you have three options. The first one is you can partner with somebody who does have that advantage so that you're drawing upon their natural ability. The second thing you can do is you can pretend that that's who you are for a limited amount of time, but knowing that it's going to be exhausting and it's going to be kind of a, an, an agonizing period for you where you're, you're not going to feel natural, but maybe you need to do it because you have, you have to make payroll or there's, there's a certain marquee quality to having a client like American Express. And the third thing that you can do is to explain to American Express to, to convince them why they don't need meticulous follow-through and what they actually need is pioneering ideas. I see. That's very interesting. Um, okay, so you can you can take you can take use of, like let's say you you're 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 again um, passion and creativity, which is the almost like the opposite of meticulous follow through. Um, mm-hmm. You can say, listen, meticulous follow through is important, and that's something we can outsource easily. But what right. you really need are these three things to to reinvigorate the fire that your customers have always had for you. Yeah, that that's a that's an awesome example. That's, that's, a, that's exactly it. I mean, if you, there are certain things that clients need. Like, let, let's say they, they say, um, we need you to um, do expense reports. Then you can be like, well, of course we can do expense reports. Any dumbass can do expense reports. That's not our highest and best. You, know, you, you, you can go down the street. We'll, we'll, we're happy to um, open up the yellow pages for you, and you can go find people who can create expense reports. But if what you want is heavy lifting, world-changing ideas, then you need to come to us. And so the way you position yourself in the market can be downplaying what your competitors offer so that there's a higher value placed on what you do. But let's turn it around and let's say that you do deliver meticulous follow through. Then you might say something like, well, you don't want world changing ideas. I mean, come on, the market is already so chaotic and there's so much uncertainty. What you really need is meticulous follow through. The key is to be able to position yourself so that you're adding as much value as possible. It's really interesting because I was talking to a guy recently who bought a chain of Domino's pizza stores in actually your hometown, Sally, Orlando. And Mm -hmm. uh, he said they they were failing. And I said, I asked him, how can a Domino's pizza store fail? Like they have (laughs) a natural customer base because they're always in college towns. So everybody in every college student orders from Domino's and it's sort of a chain like they're all the same. And he said, I'll tell you, it was one thing. They did not make round pizzas. Like they kept screwing up the pizza making process <laughs> and their pizzas were all sorts of shapes and sizes and they weren't delivering on time. So what he presented to them, you know, when he took over the business, what he presented to his customers was one thing, meticulous follow through. He didn't need passion. He didn't need to throw a big party or anything like that. He just needed to make round pizzas. Yeah, that's an awesome example. So meticulous follow through would seem like that would be lowest common denominator. Like, well, of course you're going to make round pizzas. Why is that even, why does that even need to figure into the equation? But in that particular situation, that was the competitive advantage that would allow him to make sure they were doing the basics right. So then he could leverage the Domino's brand. So, so I want to take this to something where the, the listener could, could make effective use. Now, obviously they should buy your book how the world sees you. They should also buy fascinate your seven triggers for persuasion and captivation. And I, I agree with the notion of that. Like it's really great to know the tools and techniques that you personally can use to light up a room as opposed to make everybody think you're inauthentic or whatever. But what, what, what are some takeaways someone can, can use? It, it seems like first identify whether you're delivering value or taking up space. This is really important to, to know. What other things should they know? Well, there are three things that we can learn from brands. Uh, First of all, don't focus on how you're similar to others. Focus on how you're different. 
So when you go into any kind of a presentation or pitch, any, any type of communication that's do or die, don't focus on how you like other people or better than other people. Instead, focus on how you're different. Different is better than better. Different is a better competitive advantage than being better. That's really fascinating. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've, you've tested this out with scientific research, but what's the psychology behind that? Like, why is different better than better? Being the best isn't enough if nobody notices or cares. If you come up with the best ideas that nobody notices or cares, you may as well have never come up with those ideas in the first place. You know who said something very similar on this podcast was actually Peter Thiel, uh, where he basically said, it's not good enough to be 20% better than your competition because nobody really knows how to recognize someone who's 20% better. You kind of have to... Establish establish your own monopoly in a related niche, and that's how people know. Or you have to be ten times better, and then you're easily recognizable as better. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, better is very expensive. It costs a lot of money to be better than your competition, but it doesn't necessarily cost money to be different. And different is something that is a natural extension of you. And that's what this that's what the fascination advantage assessment is about. Is in what way are you different? Than your competition. So, th- so that was the. So the first thing is different is better than better. And and the and thing is, without sorry, taking the full test, what's an easy way for someone to tell what their natural you know triggers are? Well, I have an I have an even better answer to that question, which is why don't we give away assessments to your audience and and they can find out for themselves what their differences actually are. What sure. If we opened up a code that. Uh, what would you like your code to be? What's a one word code? Could be James. James. Be yeah. I like James. that. Okay. So we're going to put up a code. The code is going to be James. And let's say it's, it's, it's good for three months and you can put this into your show notes so people can take the assessment and then they can report back in their comments. What they find is their advantage. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, great. Well, what's the URL they should go to? How to fascinate.com slash you y o u so how to fascinate dot com forward slash you y o u and then it's going to ask you for a code so that you can take it for free instead of paying for it and the free code will be james j a m e s and uh, and um, and we'll leave that open I bet you I bet you could get some pretty cool commentary going and then James what we can do is we can tell you what your results are. So that um, so we can tell you how you're different than the average population, how your audience is most likely to persuade and captivate. OK, so if Claudia Azula Altucher signs up for this, can you please send me her test results immediately? Okay. <laughs> yes. So, yes. So, so that's great. So so what the, what are they going to find? They're, they're going to take this assessment and then you're going to tell them what t- personality type they are. And then from this, they're going to know kind of what keywords they should focus on, not even say, but focus on when they're in a, a I'm going to call it a high stakes meeting because low stakes, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. It's going to describe how people see them at their best. Imagine if you had a mirror that could, instead of reflecting back all of your insecurities and imperfections, imagine if this mirror reflected how your client is most likely to see you at your best so that you can focus in on those traits and build your whole presentation and build your whole business model around that. That's what the assessment is all about. It was created for entrepreneurs and high-end professionals to be able to see how they're most likely to contribute so that instead of being all over the place, they can hone in almost like this is your advertising agency that's helping you position yourself in a crowded market. To learn their primary advantage, that number one communication advantage they have, your secondary advantage, which is your number two highest score, and then also your dormant advantage. And the dormant advantage is that area of quicksand that you and I were talking about earlier, those, those tasks and conversations that are exhausting so that you can know whether you should avoid them or delegate them or, or convince your client otherwise. So, okay, Sally, I have a couple other questions to ask you that are a little offbeat. One is, <laughs> Bring you, it on. you have eight children, how the hell did that happen? I mean, I know technically how it happens, but but eight is a lot. Are you like, uh, and excuse me for asking, like, are you a born again Christian or no. something? No, no. My 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 husband and I are both. This is our second marriage. In my husband's first marriage, he had six kids. In my first marriage, I had two kids. So now we have eight together, and we have five in college this year. Oh my God! Why are you sending five kids to college? That's like. 
a half a million dollars you have to spend a year. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. That's like the Brady Bunch. Okay. That was, that was one question. When, when you first met your husband and, you, and he had six kids and you had two, did you think to yourself, this is a little too much for me to handle? Or did you think, oh gosh, this solves the problem of a guy not wanting to meet me because I have two kids already? So that is such a funny question. I've never been asked that. Do you remember we were talking before about online dating? My husband and I met in online dating, and I was so immediately captivated by him, by his by his online dating profile, that I fell head over heels in love. I, I wouldn't have cared if he had had 20 kids. He's, Just he's from his profile. Okay, you have to tell me what his profile said. You know what? I know what his profile said. His profile said... I have a tan, all my teeth, and I can easily see my belly button. I read books without pictures. I, I, I watch movies with dialogue, and I don't consider KFC an ethnic food. If you're looking for a guy who appreciates the finer things in life, but then um, 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 I'm, I'm looking for a woman who appreciates the finer things in life but is willing to settle for me. So all I read right. that. My heart went pitter pat, and the rest is history. That that's clever. He was definitely uh, an innovator there. <laughs> no question. Yeah, he has, he has primary innovation. He's very creative, and he's also my business partner. He was a trial attorney for twenty three years at a partner at one of the most successful firms in Orlando. And earlier this year, he left the law to come be my full time um, leader in the business. He's the president of How to Fascinate. Oh, that's great. Is it fun working together? Uh, most of the time. I mean, the thing, you know, it's like then you, you, most of the time it's absolutely awesome. And the rest of the time it's going to sleep talking about business. Yeah, you, cause of, you can't leave the work at home. That's the, the issue I have with uh, my wife. We work together, but it, but it's fun on, on the whole. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it, 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 that's the ultimate lifestyle in a lifestyle business is, is being able to travel together and do things together and experience it together. Otherwise, otherwise you're just, you know, crisscrossing in parts. So here's the other question I have. Your older sister is an Olympic gold medal winner. Um, did this like create a, a damper on your childhood? Like, were you always overshadowed? <laughs> like, oh, my older sister, she only won the Olympic gold medal. Yeah, like, well, actually, it's even worse than that. She only won three gold medals and a silver in swimming. Do you remember this? Nancy Hogshead, 1984, Los Angeles in swimming. Um, yeah, it was really hard. In the same year, my brother graduated from Harvard. So I was the baby of the family. And I just, I, I learned early on a lesson that all of us need to know as entrepreneurs, how do we earn attention in a crowded and competitive environment by understanding our distinct personality advantages? And I found that mine was creativity. It wasn't athletics. It wasn't academics. It was being able to see things from an untraditional point of view. Yeah, because not only did you have like kind of the younger sibling syndrome, but your older sibling was the best in the world at whatever she wanted to do. Yeah. When I was seven years old, she had two world records in Guinness Book of World Records in swimming. So, I, I, I mean, I learned early on how, what it feels like to be an underdog. But, but that, that's where you learn. You, 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 you don't learn how to be fascinating. You unlearn how to be boring. That's a really good way to put it. You unlearn how to be boring. And this could le- this could probably lead to your interest in fascination because you had to learn how to shine in a room where your sister was always going to shine. Yes. Yeah. And 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 think of this as a metaphor. If you're an entrepreneur and somebody else has a bigger budget or they're more famous or they have a better client list than you, how do you come in as the underdog and still be able to find your own way to shine? And the answer is not to try to outdo the leader in the category. The answer is to find your own category. All right. Well, and they can do that by um wait, I wrote down the URL. Uh, <laughs> how they can go to how to fascinate dot com slash you and use the code name James and figure out all about themselves. I think this will be highly useful. I'm going to do it myself. And then I'm going to watch over her shoulder while my wife does it. And um, I hope everybody else gets a chance to do it. So Sally, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I want to say the titles correctly of your, of your books. Hold on a second. I just had them on my page right here. Uh, (laughs) 
How the World Sees You, um, and the subtitle is Discover Your Highest Value Through the Science of Fa Fascination, and this just came out. And uh, your older book is Fascinate, Your Seven Triggers to Persuasion and Captivation. And I'm definitely going to make use of these. So thanks very much for, for joining me on my podcast, Sally. Hey. Thank you so much. I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of of your work and what you do, and I think you 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 already know how to be fascinating. And I, I appreciate having the chance to be able to describe this and and share this with your audience. Oh, thank you very much. Well, great. Well, and hopefully the audience will take this test and it'll be of great use. Fantastic. Thanks, Allie. Bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. Or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Limited.